Welcome to Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, January 15, 2023. I am Reverend Mary Tillman, an Associate Minister at Pleasant Green, and I am the presenter of today's lesson. We're still in the winter quarter, and our winter quarter study is Chosen, Not Choice. We're in Unit 2, and Unit 2's theme is God's Promises. This is lesson number three and unit number two. The lesson title in the Townsend Press Sunday School Commentary is God Promises to Guide Our Way. And in the Faith Pathway Bible Studies for Adults, the lesson title is Not by Our Own Devices. Our devotional reading Psalm 119, verses 81 through 96. The background scripture, Isaiah chapter 48, verses 1 through 22. Our print passage, Isaiah chapter 48, verses 3 through 8a and verse 17. Our key verse is Isaiah 48 and 17. From the NIV Bible, it reads, This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God, who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. Let us pray. Father God, the giver and sustainer of life, We humbly bow before you with thanksgiving and praise for your grace and your mercy. Please forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. Lead us in the paths of righteousness. And Father, we thank you for the promise to lead and guide us as we sojourn in this world that is filled with temptations and distractions. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our lesson introduction. Isaiah was called to the prophetic ministry in the year King Uzziah died. And that's in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. It is believed that Isaiah the prophet wrote all 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah and that the book includes dramatic prophetic declarations of Cyrus the Great in the Bible, acting to restore the nation of Israel from Babylonian captivity. However, most of the book can be dated only in general terms because few specific dates were given. The message from God recorded in this lesson was directed to the people of Judah who were or would be in Babylonian captivity. God's chosen people had developed the sinful habit of being stubborn toward God and his will. Although this chapter 48 is intended to provide comfort for God's people in exile, the message does not shrink from holding the people accountable for their stubbornness and their sins. The initial matter that needs to be addressed is that giving God his due means giving God that to which he is entitled and of which he is deserving. Giving God his due is not doing him a favor. Instead, we're giving him what we owe him. Throughout the history of the Old Testament, the Hebrew people often failed to give God the glory and the credit for their victories and blessings due him. They typically would give God his due only when their backs were against the wall, everything else had failed, and they realized that they only had God to depend on. What about us today? When we are blessed or successful, do we give God the glory and the credit at those moments, or do we take the credit and brag on what we did without ever giving God thanks? How many of us are guilty of trying everything else before going to God in prayer? We too, like the people of Judah, are guilty of not giving God his due praise and honor for our victories. So we need to take out time every day 
and tell God thank you for the victories we have won. So get your Sunday school book, your Bible, pen and notepad, and any other devices that you may use and follow along as we go forward with this wonderful lesson. Let's get started. Again, the title of our lesson is Not By Our Own Devices. There are three questions I would like for you to consider. Question number one. How does God describe the attitude and actions of Israel in this lesson? Question number two. What does this lesson teach us about God's love for his children? And question number three. Why is it important to listen and adhere to God's teaching? Oh, I can hear you answering that one right now. Let's take a look at the lesson's biblical context. This week's lesson is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 48. Isaiah's message in this chapter summarizes the messages of chapters 40 through 47, assuring the Jews of their promised deliverance from Babylon through Cyrus. Through the prophets, God had warned the people well in advance of the exact consequences of their sin and idolatry. God knew that his people would forsake him, yet from his faithfulness and love, he saved them. God's people had developed the sinful habit of being stubborn and against his will. This chapter 48 is part of the prophecy section that emphasizes comfort for God's people as noted in chapters 40 through 48. In last week's lesson, God said that despite the people's spiritual failures, he would show them mercy and bring them back from captivity and restore them. Being in exile posed a new test of faith for God's people. Babylon would have been a different environment to them. It was a nation of heathens that was well known for practicing idolatry. Making a mockery of God's people and the true God that they worshipped was a sport for the Babylonian people. The people of Babylon worshipped multiple false gods, including the kings of Babylon. Idolatry was so prevalent in Babylon that everywhere the people of God went, they were met with the presence and the practice of idolatry. The people of Judah were about to leave Babylon and return to their homeland. God had signaled the appointed day for his people's deliverance from Babylon. God would protect and provide for them, but they must live uprightly if they desire to have peace in their land. That just strikes to me a point that if we want peace, we've got to live according to the will of God. The aims for this week's Sunday School lesson are acknowledge God's hand in his continuing guide to his people, recognize human stubbornness and appreciate God's continuing faithfulness, and commit to humble reliance on God. I don't know about you, but I depend on God for everything. There are two lesson outlines in the Adult Pathway Sunday School book. I will share two key points from each of these outlines and expound some on each of them. The first outline is deliberate, and we find that in Isaiah chapter 48, verses 3 through 5. The second outline is divine. And we find that in Isaiah chapter 48, verses 6 through 8a and verse 17. Let's begin our analysis of the biblical text with the first lesson outline. Outline number one is deliberate. 
Before returning to their homeland, Judah was reminded of the sin that led the nation into captivity. The people's chief failure was they honored God with their words, but not their conduct. The background for our lesson is a declaration from the Lord, as noted in verses 1 and 2, that he saw the hardened heart and hypocrisy of Israel, who called themselves by his name and mentioned him, but not in truth and righteousness. The first two verses record God calling for Israel to listen to his word. Let's read them even though they are not a part of the printed text of our lesson today. Verse number one reads thusly, Listen to this, you descendants of Jacob, you who are called by the name of Israel and come from the line of Judah, you who take oaths in the name of the Lord and invoke the God of Israel, but not in truth or righteousness. In this passage, God reprimands Israel for placing her trust in idols and for believing that false deities were responsible for her deliverance from captivity. Verse number two says, You who call yourselves citizens of the holy city and claim to rely on the God of Israel, the Lord Almighty is his name. The people of Israel place their faith in their heritage, not in God. They did not submit to God. The people's chief failure was that they honored God with their words, but again, not in their conduct. It's one thing to say you trust God, but it is another to actually trust him and show it in your conduct. The people felt confident because they lived in Jerusalem, the city with God's temple. Heritage, buildings, or nations cannot give us a relationship with God. We must truly depend on him personally with all our heart and mind. The people failed to do the very thing that God wanted them to do. God wanted the people to depend on him. Time after time, Israel practiced ways of living that were contrary to God's will and command. The people took God's love for them for granted. Instead of trusting him, they relied on idols just like the Babylonians and the other nations around them. Today's lesson begins with verse 3. And it reads, I foretold the former things long ago. My mouth announced them and I made them known. Then suddenly I acted and they came to pass. Verse 3 introduces the them of this section. God had predicted the former things and they happened as he said they would. The Lord alludes to the times in the past when he predicted in detail things that had not yet happened and then he re and then he verified that what he predicted in detail came to pass with meticulous accuracy. God spoke in advance of events and what he spoke did come to pass. God prophesied the multiplication of Abraham's children through Isaac at a time long before Isaac was born. He prophesied the 400-year period of Israel's sojourn in Egypt. He prophesied their delivery out of Egypt. He prophesied that they would leave Egypt with great riches. He prophesied they would indeed inherit the land of Canaan. Furthermore, God prophesied that if Israel rebelled against his law, he would pluck them off the land and carry them far away. And he did. Key point number one. God is the only being who knows everything in the past, present, and future. He knows everything perfectly without mistakes or inaccuracies. What is unknowable to human beings is thoroughly known to God. The God we serve never has to guess, 
never has to assume or suspect. He knows all, which applies to things, events, and even people. Yes, you and me. God knows us through and through. He knows our thoughts even before they enter our mind, our words even before we speak them. And according to Jesus, God knows the number of hairs on our head. Our God is amazing. Verse number four reads, For I knew how stubborn you were. Your neck muscles were iron. Your forehead was bronze. God clearly sees the hard hearts and hypocrisy of his people Judah. They refused to be controlled by the Lord. Israel rejected God's hand and the evidence of his presence and guidance. Even though God knew who they were, he yet loved them. He knew they would be defiant, having neck muscles of iron, as we just read in verse 4, unwilling to submit to God's commands or bend to his will. They were going against God's will. God was not pleased with Israel's behavior, and he was letting them know of his disappointment. God used very descriptive language to emphasize that the people were stubborn, inflexible, and hard-hearted. He used language such as iron and bronze. God called Israel stubborn for placing her trust in idols. The description of the people's necks being like iron and their foreheads like bronze indicates the stubbornness and obstinacy of Israel. This description speaks of their unwillingness to feel guilt or shame about their wrongdoing. Yet, even though God punished them through grace, he provided deliverance. God does not save us because we are good. God saves us because he loves us and is a forgiving God. Key point number two, God is faithful even in our rebellion and stubbornness. Verse number five reads, Therefore, I told you these things long ago. Before they happened, I announced them to you so you could not say, My images brought them about. My wooden image and metal God ordained them. Israel had embraced idolatry and ignored God. God had told what would happen so they would be without excuse. See, Judah was truly without excuse. They knew the greatness and the power of God, yet they lived with only a religious image without a spiritual reality. God spoke it. They heard it. Then suddenly what was spoken was upon them. The word suddenly should not be understood literally in this context, but only in the sense that those who face the consequences of ignoring God often feel as if their punishment has come abruptly. See verse 4. God often confirms his own words by declaring it before it happens, verifying that it has come from no other source but God himself. Specifically, God did not want Israel to claim that their circumstances were the work of any false god. He made it clear. He spoke it, and it happened. Outline number two is divine. Verse six says, You have heard these things. Look at them all. Will you not admit them? From now on, I will tell you of new things, of hidden things unknown to you. And verse 7, they are created now and not long ago. You have not heard of them before today. So you cannot say, yes, I knew of them. The Lord has spoken to his people in the past, but from this time forward, they would hear new things which no doubt relates to the deliverance from the Babylonian exile. God once again tells them his plan in advance, 
namely that he is going to lead Israel back to their land. Verse 8a reads, You have neither heard nor understood. From of old your ears have not been open. Key point number one. God is faithful not because of human goodness or merit, but because of his unfailing love and mercy. Verses 6 through 8 refers to the newness of what God was revealing. The Lord was emphatic. The deliverance of Israel was not on the account of her own merit, rather for the Lord's account and for his glory. In verse 8, God emphasizes that there was nothing in the people's actions and attitudes for accomplishment that would motivate him to save them. Yet, in the subsequent verses, God's love overrides his frustration with Israel, and he told the people he would save them for his own sake. Then we jump down to verse 17. But I encourage you to read the entire 48th chapter of Isaiah. Verse 17, the last verse in our lesson says, This is what the Lord says, and this is our key verse. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. Key point number two. God guides and teaches his people, directing them toward what is best for them and leading them in the path that they should go. Many Christians pray for God's guidance, and we prove our sincerity by making every effort to go where God guides us. God wanted the surrounding nations to know that he alone was and is superior to any idols or worship rituals. Although God was not pleased with Israel's conduct, like a loving parent, God continued to guide his people because he wanted only the best for his people. He was sad to see the suffering they had brought on to themselves through their stubborn disobedience. If they had paid attention and followed his instructions, they would have enjoyed unbroken peace and prosperity. My, my, my. Brothers and sisters, if we follow God, obey him, and go where he tells us to go and do what he tells us to do, our lives would be much sweeter, much more peaceful, and prosperous. In summary, in this lesson, God shows his people that he is omniscient, all-knowing. He knows everything. There is no limit to God's wisdom and knowledge. He can see and tell what will happen long before it happens. When he describes what will happen, he does it with divine detail and flawless accuracy. Whatever God declares will happen exactly as he says it will. Simply put, God knows the ending before the beginning. Only God is omniscient. Only God can give those whom he chooses the gift of to predict certain things that are yet to come. We learn from this lesson that sin manifested itself in the form of stubbornness, disobedience, and idolatry. These are some of the key sins we need to guard against and ward off through prayer even today. The truth is that idols and false gods can come in Various forms and personalities. Idols can be possessions, loved ones, friends, and even ourselves. Our idols are anything that we adore or cherish more than God. God wants us to put our complete trust in him. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, and it's my favorite scripture, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall 
direct your path. If you want to go the right way, then you need to put all your trust in the Lord and don't listen to your own understanding. As Christians, we have hope for the future through our faith in God through Christ Jesus. We know our lives are in God's hand. Because of our faith, we boldly and confidently walk through life trusting God, even when we are fearful. God is faithful. Let me say that again. God is faithful, even in our rebellion and stubbornness. Our closing thought and question. God wants us to honor him in our conduct and faithfulness, not just in our words. He does not want us to take him or his love for granted. He wants us to put him first and acknowledge him. He wants our total submission. So the question is, what can you do this week to demonstrate your total faithfulness and total submission to God? What can you do this week to demonstrate your total faithfulness and total submission to God? Thank you for listening. I hope you got a thought out of the lesson. And I hope you saw areas where you, like me, can improve and how we follow God's directions, instructions, and commands. Let us pray. Father God. Thank you so much for this lesson. Thank you for bringing to the forefront of our minds how easily we can be misled through our own devices and conduct. Please forgive us and help us to get back on track by submitting to your will and to your way. Please, God, Father, order our steps. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great day.